All right, thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you for having us and hopefully we can keep the uh, energy levels up here as we get through the end of today's presentations. We are the team from Carnegie Mellon presenting on the PNNL district use case. First, just wanted to start with a little overview of our team and what we were able to do. Uh, we are a team of four graduate students at Carnegie Mellon, three MBA students and one student from the College of Engineering, uh, requiring us to mix and match a lot across the different deliverables in this project. Uh, we really kind of shared the resources and figured out the things that no one really had any expertise in and worked together really out of just pure interest in the field and development of renewables, not associated with any sort of class, but we had a great faculty mentor in Panos Mutis who has a lot of personal experience in renewables development, as well as help from our professional mentors Ash Pawar from Orsted and Christian Sanchez from AES. For our design, what we really wanted to focus on was creating the largest PV systems possible to benefit from the economies of scale and meet the resilience requirements of the campus. What that resulted in is three PV systems, one rooftop system at the EMSL building, the centerpiece of the campus, and two ground mount systems in the northern portion of the campus what we called ground mount two and ground mount three. This comes out to about a 6.1 megawatt DC system uh, at about a $1.25 uh, watt DC cost. The battery system was sized to meet the resiliency requirements of the campus and also peak shift some of the excess generation from the PV systems given the zero tolerance from the local utility in excess gen being put back onto the grid. And in summary, all of this came together into a customer MPV of minus $5 million, given the relatively low utility costs for the campus today and a PPA price of about 10 and a half cents. Before we go into the details, just a little overview of how we approach the problem. Uh, we really early on focused on the analysis of the uh, site, as well as the loads that were given to us, uh, going through the master plan, really understanding the layout of the campus, where was buildable, where was not, what kind of fit into the overall structure, and then selected our sites from there, and then went through an iterative process with our PV and storage system design, and on a weekly basis, tuned that as we found issues in the system impact analysis, financial analysis, and development planning. So these three sites were selected on five criteria we have here on the left, the scalability of the site and the proximity to the load, to minimize costs and then compliance with the campus master plan, opportunities for exposure throughout the campus and education opportunities, as well as the opportunity cost for future development of these sites. That resulted in ground mount two and ground mount three being selected in the left-hand picture and the environmental science building uh, in the middle of the right-hand picture. Ian. Thanks, Sean. Uh, the three selected sites consist of Ground Mount 2, shown on the top there. It's our largest site. It's 4.1 megawatts DC with 5.6 gigawatt hours of annual production. Ground Mount 3 in the middle is a 1.4 megawatt DC, 1.8 gigawatt hour site. And finally, the EMSL rooftop is a 600 kilowatt DC, 700 megawatt hour system. While we did find additional space, at the Ground Mount 3 site, the site in the middle, which allowed for the elimination of the rooftop system. We felt that the public visibility offered by this rooftop uh, solar was important to demonstrate PNNL's commitment to sustainability um, and was worth the extra financial cost for that. 470 watt commercial modules were chosen from SunPower, now Maxian due to their high efficiency of almost 22%, low degradation guarantee of less than a quarter percent per year over their 25 year life, and cradle to cradle silver certification, meaning that they're very circular and highly recyclable at the end of their life. We chose these larger modules uh, to reduce the total module count and the associated uh, installation and mounting hardware costs. We also selected a high tilt angle of 45 degrees and this was based on our primary goal of resilience and the inability to excess to excuse me export excess generation to the grid. The tilt angle reduces the seasonal variation in our generation profile by reducing excess generation in the summer and increasing winter production at Rich Richland's high latitude. 
This contributes to uh, resiliency by reducing battery dispatch in the event of a grid outage in the winter. Uh, and even with this high tilt angle, we saw little uh, sacrifice in performance based on that reduction in summer production with a specific yield of uh, more than 1,300 kilowatt hours to kilowatt peak for the ground mount areas and more than 1,200 for the rooftop area. These production estimates were done in Aurora using uh, NREL's physical solar model weather data set in the Perez irradiance model. And our LFP battery design was guided with REOP to meet three requirements. Uh, those are the power and energy requirements to meet the critical load requirement, storage and storage of the excess generation, and the reduction of demand charges uh, with peak shaving. And Sean will speak more about our energy solution. Thanks, Ian. Going into our storage solution a little bit deeper, we started with a minimum size of the critical load requirement of the campus that was provided to us, and then scaled up the additional size to mitigate the excess generation we were seeing from the PV site. And through this, there's a trade-off between the battery size and the cost uh, per kW. And what we found is about an 89% recovery of the uh, excess generation accounting for the round trip efficiency losses of the battery. The operating strategy uh, requires the battery to have an idea of what the solar and load uh, requirements will be for the day. We'll discharge any uh, kilowatt hours that we see can be charged through the excess PV throughout the day, and then discharge any excess towards the evening uh, when the battery returns to a state of charge that meets the requirements for the critical loads. Overall, this results in a average state of charge of about 58% throughout the year and 63 annual cycles per year. I'll turn it back over to Ian to talk about our distribution system impact analysis. Thanks, Sean. So under Washington law, we, net metering is not required for a system of this size. So we have assumed that permission to export will not be granted. Thus, we, we designed our system to prevent excess generation in all cases. We accomplish this by sizing our uh, arrays carefully, considering peak generation, using our battery to store excess production, and with smart inverter technology to cur curtail when needed. Our DC to AC ratio of about 1.2 means that the peak production is uh, clipped during certain times, which reduces this uh, generation peak and increases the financial efficiency of uh, fixed costs, such as the inverters and transformers. Um, the direct connection of the rooftop solar to the EMSL building, which is the largest load on campus, serves to reduce utility servicing and also eliminate the need for distribution system upgrades in that area. Our chosen inverters have smart inverter monitoring technology, which allows overcurrent and overvoltage conditions to be identified uh, to prevent voltage transients and thermal excursions in the distribution system. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Um, I talk about the uh, financial analysis here. Um, in the uh, solar plus storage case, the system cost is $1.62 per watt. Uh, for the cost estimation, we referred to the latest publication from NREL and uh, Bloomberg's website. The equity financing ratio is around 80%. And the tax equity share is 70%. Uh, the PPA price, uh, which makes the net present value of this project zero, is uh, $0.10 uh, per kilowatt hour in the solar plus storage case. Um, the utility price is just uh, $0.05 per kilowatt hour. So the customer NPV is negative. I expect. Thanks, Kay. So here we want to talk about the development plan. So here are the authorities having jurisdiction over the survey that we identified. Um, that includes federal authorities like the Department of Energy and GSA, international authorities, um, state authorities, county, municipal, utility, and city authorities. And we identified the necessary codes and permits in several categories, including energy, building, construction, land, fire, environmental, and utility. And that was all included in our plan. Um, and we did not identify a need to rezone. Next. 
Uh, in the remainder of our presentation, we wanna discuss how we address these four potential risks and challenges uh, to successful project development. Disruption to the campus, stakeholder engagement, supply chain delays and labor shortages, and distributional equity and workforce transition. So our proposed timeline for this project follows five stages, and we expect that our timeline for this project will likely be around 14 months. However, we have recommended adding up to a year for contingency based on current supply chain disruptions and labor shortages in part due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, it was important for us um, that we developed a stakeholder engagement plan um, to address disruptions to the campus and the greater Richland community, especially if it was gonna be over that long of a period of time. So our plan provides a meeting schedule and goals for stakeholders such as GSA, Richland community meetings, indigenous communities, the Atomic Heritage Foundation and the EMSL uh, building researchers. Next slide. Um, so the kind of the meat of our plan also is that we believe that the benefits of this project should reach beyond the PNNL campus. And therefore that's why we propose, propose developing the Richland Solar Energy Training Program in partnership uh, with this project. So this program would work with local community colleges like the Walla Walla Community College and the Blue Mountain Community College to create a professional solar training program where students from these programs would work on real world projects like the solar array to gain experience as part of their degree program. And students and young professionals from this program would then be able to work on other solar arrays in Richland and Washington State, um, which would then contribute to the state's overall clean energy workforce transition as well as mitigate issues around the current labor shortages. Additionally, to avoid supply chain delays, we encourage the project to utilize local Richland services and regional businesses, as well as salvage materials to alleviate those. Um, and we believe that this is actually part of, uh, this program demonstrates part of our resilience efforts. Next slide. Another way that we focus on engaging the community is creating an educational walking path around the EMSL facility uh, where the rooftop array is. And this is a self-guided tour that would fit seamlessly into the already existing pathways on the campus. So the tour would include maybe QR stops, QR codes for people to connect with the real uh, time solar data, interactive elements and educational signage about renewable energy, environmental education and land acknowledgements. Next slide. So in conclusion, our system is designed to maximize the values of these four traits. Resiliency using our battery and operation strategy, cost-effective system by optimizing the PV uh, system and scale, compatibility of the system with the campus master plan, codes, permits, and overall goals of the campus, and equity by creating a community training program and other opportunities for researchers and community members alike to utilize and interact with the system. Um, we wanna thank our mentors, the host site, and the organizers of this competition, and we're now open for questions. Thank you.